Welcome to the Rheumatology Highlights Report presented by the Cleveland Clinic and the R.J. Fassmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology. I'm Greg Silverman, Professor of Medicine and Pathology from the New York University School of Medicine. And today's topic is systemic lupus erythematosus, pathology diagnosis and treatment. Disclosures, I've been a consultant for several companies as listed here. Our learning objectives today is that we will discuss recent advances in the understanding of the pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus, primarily by reviewing reports on the development of new therapeutic agents for the treatment of systemic lupus erythematosus. Here we see a table from a very recent review that discusses new agents currently in clinical trials for the treatment of lupus. So we can see that lupus has now become a very attractive disease for the development of new therapies, therapies which we dearly need. For many years, lupus was essentially an orphan disease. And in fact, up until very recently, there had been no new agent approved by the FDA for the treatment of lupus for almost 50 years. But here we can see that there's almost two dozen agents that are now in clinical trials. From the familiar mycophenolate mofetil, which is not yet actually FDA approved, to a number of different biologic agents that use monoclonal antibodies or other kinds of fusion proteins to be able to specifically block well-known pathways, cytokines, and chemokines, several of which we're going to be discussing today. We can see that certain targets are really becoming increasingly attractive. Targeting of B lymphocytes, as we'll discuss shortly by epituzumab, which targets uh, CD22 on many B cells, as well as the targeting of these survival factors called April and BLIS. BLIS is the same as BAF. It's a B lymphocyte stimulating factor. BAF is, is a synonym. It's a B cell activating factor. April is a first cousin, very similar. There are decoy receptors like Atacocept, as well as antibodies that target bliss alone, such as belimumab, which we'll discuss as well, and there are other formulations also in uh, development. A particular interest we'll see is that there are at least three different monoclonal antibodies that are being developed for the targeting of alpha interferon. Specifically, we're going to discuss early results from trials in cifilimumab. So type 1 interferons are very important regulators of immune responses in health and disease. At left, we can see that within the peripheral immune system, plasma cytoid dendritic cells are major producers of systemic interferon alpha. And when this is released into the circulation, it can result in autoimmunity and inflammation through increased dendritic cell maturation, modulation of B cells so that they will class switch potentially to classes of immunoglobulin like IgG, I, subclasses that are important for activation responses and can cause a lot of tissue damage, as well as the induction of chemokine production. In contrast to that is another type of type 1 interferon called interferon beta. And this may actually be an anti-inflammatory agent, which is one of the reasons that it's used for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. So this related molecule, but very different activities, results in the production of IL-10, the production of a receptor antagonist for IL-1, and can actually interfere with cell proliferation. And each of these two different forms of type 1 interferon may be differentially expressed in different types of autoimmune diseases. We're specifically interested in lupus today. And in fact, interferon alpha first identified more than two decades ago as being elevated in the circulation of lupus patients is now increasingly attractive, potentially because it has been implicated as a possible mediator of disease itself. So the recent European meetings in rheumatology described the early results, the first report on early trials in cifilimumab. Now this is an antibody to interfere on alpha, and it specifically is neutralizing for this type of uh, cytokine it forms complexes with alpha interferon that block uh, the formation of receptor interactions that will result in internalization and signaling. So for many reasons, it's very sophisticated and potentially a very effective way of stopping the effects on inflammation of alpha interferon. So results were reported from early phase 1B and 2A clinical trials in patients that had moderate to severe 
lupus activity. Of course, the primary goals in these early trials were safety and tolerability. The secondary goals were to assess pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, which is actually what it does to biologically in vivo, as well as potentially for immunogenicity. A number of different dosing regimens were examined. Patients received from one up to a total of 13 doses, and there were also intravenous and subcutaneous forms that were evaluated. Patients also were dosed from weekly to biweekly to monthly, and these were in comparison to placebo-treated patients. What were the key findings? Well, most importantly, the question is whether or not this antibody can in interact or interfere with interferon-mediated activities in vivo. So these scientists first developed assays that could measure whether or not there was interferon activity in vivo. They did this by two ways. They looked at levels of, of type 1 interferons in the bloodstream. This is circulating proteins. And they also took cells and extracted the RNA from it, and they looked for different transcripts, up to 21 different type 1 interferon-inducible mRNAs. What they found, in fact, was learned, uh, they learned a lot about biology. They found that there was a correlation between transcript signatures uh, as well as with the protein levels of this type 1 interferon. So there was a relatedness, and up to a half of the patients showed a very significant interferon signature. They also found that this signature moderately well correlated with the lupus disease activity index, the sleet eye index, as well as with the BILAG score, which is the British Isle lupus activity score. Uh, so this is very important because it seemed as though disease activity might well be impacted by interferon being expressed in vivo. And patients that had very high levels of SLEDI as well as BILAG disease activity were more likely to have a very significant and prominent interferon signature. What they found that was important was biologically, the higher the dose that they used of cifalimumab, the more they seem to interfere with and block the expression of this interferon signature. So there are dose-dependent changes. So biologically, the antibodies seem to be active. Unfortunately, with dosing up to 10 milligrams per kilogram, they did not find that there was a clinical benefit. So there was no impact on the sleet eye or the bilag. And even though these dosings were well tolerated and there was a very attractive safety profile and there was no significant immunogenicity that was found in these early trials, they did not find that neutralization of the interferon signature affected the level of disease activity. So this is really relatively disconcerting, but it was argued, in fact, that it was just a guess what effective doses would be needed, and 10 milligrams per kilogram may not be sufficient to have an impact on clinical disease activity. So the outcome was that, in fact, having completed these early trials and documented a uh, attractive level of safety, they're going back to further trials that will use higher doses of this medication. So for now, there's no additional information, and we're looking forward to results in the near future on the two other agents that are known to be in clinical trials. Now we'll shift gears and look at epituzumab, which has been a monoclonal antibody that's been in development for several years for the treatment of lupus, and it targets B cells through CD22 on their surface. Uh, distinct from anti-CD20 therapies, which cause very dramatic B-cell depletion in the bloodstream, we can, in fact, see that epituzumab, uh, in different trials have been shown to have only mild levels of loss of B-cells in the bloodstream. There is also functional impairments, so the B-cells don't seem to be as active. And uh, how this works is not completely well understood, but at the recent meeting, safety data pulled from two completed open-label pilot studies were uh, put together with data from three placebo-controlled double-blinded studies, included this pivotal trial uh, that was a late phase two trial, the emblem trial, as well as data from the open label extension studies. Taken together, they now have data from 308 lupus patients and over 360 patient years of exposure. And what they found in the epituzumab treated groups is they had really a very similar safety profile to the placebo-treated groups. The only significant difference was that infusion reactions were more common at higher doses of epituzumab. There were three deaths that were reported in the epituzumab groups uh, from pneumonia, chronic heart failure, as well as from a, a stroke, but these were not thought to be necessarily directly related to the agent. So overall, it appears to have a very attractive safety profile. This table details 
uh, many of the specific results. There aren't really great differences, and there doesn't seem to be much of a trend uh, with regard to um, dosing levels, higher dosing levels correlating with uh, bigger problems with safety, um, other than, as I mentioned, that infusion reactions appear to be more common at the uh, at least the 400 milligram dose. Uh, this has to be examined further. The 1,800 milligram dose also had uh, some infusion reactions. Shifting to efficacy, results from a phase 2B trial that was a 12-week study, actually a relatively short study, a multi-center randomized double-blind and placebo-controlled study, actually did show significant clinical responses. There were only a limited number of patients that were studied in this trial, two different doses that looked at epituzumab either at 600 milligrams weekly uh, or epituzumab 1,200 milligrams every other week, and they appeared to be a separation from the uh, placebo-controlled study that was very marked by eight weeks and, uh, and was significant by the time we got to 12 weeks. Now, this is a very short study and, and uh, may be very meaningful that the mechanism of action may provide benefits in such a short time period. Uh, the study also benefited from a very um, innovative a combined response uh, primary outcome measure. There were four criteria that were needed to be fulfilled for somebody to be designated as a responder. The table, excuse me, the figure here shows the responder status, which uh, was different with each of the two different dosing regimens, uh, but appeared to separate very significantly from placebo-controlled group. Placebo-controlled group actually uh, also received background immunosuppressives and corticosteroids, which may have contributed to what is seemingly response here. Uh, to be able to be designated as a responder, as shown in this figure, you had to show that the British Isle lupus activity scale had improvement from baseline, that there was no deterioration in the, the uh, sleet eye disease activity score, no worsening in the physician's global visual assessment, and also that the patient did not require the addition of new immunosuppressives or corticosteroids, and there was no need to withdraw the epituzumab. So that's an agent which is now going into late-stage trials, and uh, we're expectantly looking forward to seeing the results. Uh, now we're going to shift to the next agent, belimumab, which is a very exciting agent that targets soluble bliss, as we discussed, and recently was approved for the treatment of lupus, the first new agent uh, approved for the treatment of lupus in almost 50 years, and the only agent, actually, that was approved based on randomized controlled trials. So belimumab targets a cytokine that is expressed uh, by multiple immune cells. It is constitutively expressed, and this factor is necessary for survival and maturation of B cells, but higher levels can be produced by activated neutrophils, monocytes, dendritic cells, activated cells, and perhaps other cells within the body. The factor it targets exists as both a membrane form, and then this can be cleaved off into a soluble form. Three of these molecules form into a trimer, which is the active form that goes into a receptor. And so belimumab was developed that it would only target the soluble form and that as a trimer. So it was thought to have specificity when there's an excess of this uh, survival factor produced in inflammatory states. And it's known that, that uh, the target, bliss or BAF, is critical for ensuring that new B cells will mature, survive, and differentiate. So now uh, there's cumulative experience from over six years of clinical trials, and these have involved over 449 lupus patients that were included in an open extension trial over this, this uh, six-year period. Um, and this adds up to over 1,500 patient years of experience. And uh, I have to say that these kind of open extension trials, patients that don't benefit or that are intolerant, of course, get off the drug, and they are included for the full period. But those that tolerate it were found to have less flares and less new organ involvement uh, compared to the uh, control groups that were in the, uh, the control part of the trial in the beginning. These patients also appear to have normalization of complement levels and there are decreases of specific types of autoantibodies as well as there appear to be a need for less oral corticosteroids. Phase three clinical trials that were recently reported showed less uh, disease activity, of course, across organ systems, and in particular, both mucocutaneous as well as immunologic, such as platelet counts, as well as uh, joint and, and uh, bone discomfort. 
and arthritis was improved over 52 weeks. All of these were measured by the BILAG. Safety was very attractive. Now followed in phase two and three trials, over 2100s, over 2100 lupus patients. Safety has been examined and pooled data from phase two and phase three trials. Now in over 2100 lupus patients, the drug is generally well tolerated. There was only a modest increase of infections. The placebo group had about 66.7% had infections, and these could be both uh, minor infections and severe infections, while 71%, a small difference on belimumab, had such infections. But there was no signature associated with opportunistic or tuberculosis, and there was no increase in malignancies. Trials uh, with uh, belimumab were conducted with a primary endpoint at 52 weeks, and as previously reported, compared to the placebo group in the uh, BLIS-52 trial, the placebo group had a 43 percent, 0.6 responder status versus 57.6 in the belimumab-treated trials with Similar but lower response rates in the BLIS-76. These differed in BLIS-76 was conducted primarily in Canada and the United States, while BLIS-52 was ex vivo, excuse me, while BLIS-52 was primarily ex USA in other countries. Moving on to the last agent that we're going to discuss very briefly, rituximab. It's a targeting agent for CD20. Uh, it has been approved, as we know, for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis in randomized controlled trials, and now is approved for treatment of TNF and adequate responders. There was two unsuccessful phase two trials, the Explorer and Lunar trials that looked at non-renal and renal lupus, uh, respectively. Uh, in retrospect, there have been concerns about study design and very high levels of corticosteroids that were allowed, as well as other remittive agents. And this report discussed here from the recent European meeting, asked the question, does experience uh, in real life actually differ from these trial results that were reported? So they looked at specifically lupus nephritis patients, 164 from nine centers in the UK and Spain, all fulfilled lupus criteria and had biopsy-proven disease. They had different measures for complete response that were really very rigorous. You needed to have normal creatinine, inactive sediment, and less than a half a gram of urinary albumin over a 24-hour period. Partial response was only 50% improvement of these parameters from compared to baseline. Most of the patients had type 3 and type 4 glomerulonephritis. Patients were allowed to receive corticosteroids, and most uh, received, in addition, cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate mofetil. And what they found was that, in fact, there seemed to be clinical benefits for the addition of rituximab in these patients, both at six months and 12 months, and uh, that this was compared to, uh, compared to the control group, that responder status actually increased, and that it went from a complete response of 27% to 30% at uh, 12 months, and um, they found in general that there were much better trends in patients that had type 3 glomerulonephritis compared to type 4 and type 5, and there was especially a bad prognosis in general, however, if patients had very severe nephrotic syndrome or renal failure institution of the trial. So the authors interpreted the results as supportive of the use of rituxin in patients with lupus nephritis that were refractory to standard treatment or who experienced a flare after intensive treatment. So in conclusion, looking at all this recent data, we're finding that advances in our understanding of lupus pathogenesis are providing new therapeutic opportunities. Cifalimumab, which is an anti-interferon alpha, presents a very exciting mechanism of action, which is designed to target a central pathway in lupus pathogenesis. However, early stage trials have shown that there is biologic activity with this antibody, but no clear therapeutic activity this may be because of the doses that were used, and trials with higher doses have already been initiated. Epertuzumab, an anti-CD22 agent that has been in development for several years, continues to show promise in mid-stage randomized controlled trials and also shows a, a good safety profile. Rituximab, an anti-CD20 agent that also targets B cells by another pathway, although it's unsuccessful in recent randomized clinical trials, has shown benefits in an open trial of 164 lupus nephritis tr patients. 
Ongoing investigations may lead to a better understanding of why some patients have more benefits than others and what may be uh, needed to be able to adapt the uh, treatment regimen to improve therapeutic responses. And lastly, let's mention belimumab, which in 2011, this antibody that targets BAF or BLIS became the first FDA-approved agent for the treatment of mild to moderate non-renal lupus, and this is the first agent that has ever been approved based on randomized controlled trials. There's now more than six years of open extension surveillance, which has documented efficacy in multiple organ systems and evidence of corticosteroid sparing effects with durable responses. So let me thank you for your attention, and I hope that you've all benefited from this recent review of new developments in therapeutics for lupus.